Okay, so today we are here with Tanya Koenig of CNN Switzerland. <laughs> How are you? Good, thank you. Tanya Koenig, thank you for doing this with me. Yeah, you're welcome. I've been watching your YouTube. If you go through your interview history, it looks like you know you, you were doing different sorts of things and then recently you, you started focusing on art. Yes, I, I did many different things. I think when I was uh, in my early 20s, I just wanted to explore all the facets there were. I remember when I did an internship in a local newspaper after high school in 2007, the editor-in-chief at the time, Michael Kaspar, told me, Tanya, if you go to university, don't study communication science, don't study journalism just first explore, travel, get to know the world, do as much as you can, and then uh, study something that you really like, like history or biology, uh, whatever, and then become a reporter in that field. So I think I took that and I did many sorts of things. I just explored. I worked as a flight attendant for Swiss Airlines. Then I decided to go to university and study Sinology, that is uh, Chinese studies. Not really because of a, it was not a career decision. It was really because I have a, some Chinese roots and I wanted to explore that. Yeah, then I lived in Beijing and there I got in touch a bit with the local art district. My roommates, we lived together in Beijing. We, they were very much into art. One of my flatmates used to work in a gallery in, in Beijing. And so I, I went to that art district with them I spoke to Chinese artists and that sort of showed me that that world is really uh, exciting but I did not have the idea of becoming an art reporter not at all really not at all I then came back to Switzerland I continued my studies uh, worked for Swiss national television as a reporter for the voice of Switzerland <laughs> And then in 2017, CNN Money Switzerland opened in, in Switzerland and I, I applied, even though I have no business background, no e economics uh, background, but they were also looking for someone to cover lifestyle topics. So I thought that's something I can do. And I offered my skills. And when I started, I didn't really knew, know exactly what my job was, but I kind of was ready to do anything. And I had the skills of filming myself, editing, so my first story, I, I was offered an interview with Ai Weiwei, with Chinese artist and dissident. Mm -hmm. in, he, was in ba he was in Venice um, premiering his movie, Human Flow. And so I, I did that. I went to Venice. I interviewed him. And uh, the Venice Biennale was ongoing at the time. And then I also went to the Swiss Pavilion. I thought, if I'm in Venice, let me do another story, cover something else. So there was this Venice Biennale. I went to the Swiss Pavilion and they had a show uh, paying tribute to Swiss uh, artist Alberto Giacometti. So I did a story on that. So my first two stories were art stories. And then I kind of became the art reporter because I think no one else in the team had, um, had anything to do with art. So yeah, that's how it happened. And then you just started uh, reaching out to people, different major figures in the art world. I, I'm impressed that right off the bat, everybody is, you know, giving you these, of course they want to be on CNN, but. Yeah, I, I just ask. <laughs> yeah, I actually, when I was working for Ringe, which is a Swiss media company, was my first job. Their owner is a known Swiss art collector, Michel Ringe. And I was 21 or so, and I met him in the hallway and I just went up to him and asked him if I could speak to him. And the assistant next to him was so impressed and she told me like, oh my God, like no one even dares to just ask him. They usually come through me or whatever, but yeah, why not? <laughs> That's great. And now you have a reputation for being the, the art reporter. You studied Sinology. Are you fluent in Chinese? You, you can order off the menu. I can order off the menu. Exactly. Yeah, no, not fluent. I mean, since I, I came back, I, I never really, I don't get to practice. So when I met Ai Weiwei, we did speak a little bit. And that's actually a good thing. I, I try to find a, a point of connection with my interview partners. And then that, like with Ai Weiwei, when I spoke a bit of Chinese, suddenly he was a different person, totally open. Yeah. Wait, is there a large Chinese population in Switzerland? No, no, not at all. And I did not um, grow up with, with a Chinese background, really, because my mom, she already grew up in Portugal. So my mother tongue is Portuguese. I, was, I wasn't really aware that I'm, I have Chinese roots until a certain age somehow. Yeah. So that's your connection to Portugal. You, you were reporting on Brazil. 
right? I reported on, for Portuguese uh, television, and that was I was a reporter in Switzerland reporting about Portuguese businesses and diaspora here. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah I was wondering. You're you you're a polyglot. Yes. You know. Yeah, yeah, very much. I mean, it, it started already when I was born. I was born in Australia to a Swiss father, to a Chinese Portuguese mother, and then yeah. The so many so many roots. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. No, I always considered the world. I, I feel comfortable almost everywhere I go. I think I never went to a place where I did not feel okay, or I didn't. I always try to find a connection. Yeah. So you've been reporting on on art. You have a passion for art. You're finding kind of. That, are you an artist yourself? I'm not. I'm not. You, you know, when I was a, a small child, I dreamed of becoming an artist. I think I was around seven or so. I thought I want to become an artist. I don't know why. But no, I, I've bought a few canvases and, and stuff, but I never... I think I liked the idea, but uh, I, I, I also skipped a few art classes in high school, <laughs> I remember, <laughs> because I hated to try all these techniques I, I think I'm more of I would just do what I, I like but not having to do okay portrait and and going through all that so you're a you're a collector not yet <laughs> but um I think I, I have to start at some point you're getting some good advice on how to do it <laughs> I am I am and you know I th that's what I really like about the art world or why I like reporting about it is because it's so it's so exciting. And I think also the idea of artists, that's why I like to speak to artists as well. I think they are characters and they have something to say. Yeah, collectors, whether it's art dealers, usually they have something to say, they have anecdotes, they have stories to share. And then the business itself is so intransparent in and you don't really know how it works. It's a handshake deal or it's very um, much on the personal level. All of these things are so interesting. That's why I love reporting about it. And it kind of fascinates me. Well, you bring up the, the business aspect of it. You did an interview with um, Eva. Presenhuber? Uh, yes. And you tried to ask her kind of about the money side of the art business and she wouldn't talk about it. She said, no, it's not about money. And Yes, I think, of course, the art is for, for people in the art world, they like to, of course, it's about the art and that is what is important. Uh, so they don't really like to admit that business is important as well. What is interesting now during the COVID-19 crisis, you can see that actually business is important. So the interview you're referring to, I interviewed her, I think that was maybe a year or two ago. And I just interviewed her last week, so very recent again. And, and she told me that it's really bad now and that business is down and what she needs to do is to sell art so she can pay her bills. So I think the business is important, but of course that shouldn't be your main purpose or your driver why you're doing it. Um, I think a lot of people are scrambling to, you know, create their sort of virtual art market presence. Like Art Basel, Dominic Levy said that that kind of affects, and, and so did the director of MCH, you know, that you have to see the art in person. I um, pretty much agree with Dominic Levy. For me, looking at art uh, in these virtual viewing rooms, it's okay to get an idea of what it is, especially if it's a two-dimensional uh, art piece. But if I think of a sculpture or even something uh, bigger or a performance, all these things, I think you need to see it um, in the context or in the space. Even with the artwork, you want to see it. How does it look on this wall in this space? How does it interplay with the space around? Me? And also, I think art, it's a conversation between the piece and the viewer. And on a screen, it's a bit more difficult. But I think that the virtual art market is an add-on. You need it. And, and every art dealer, artist nowadays kind of needs this online presence because it can help you um, reach a wider audience. It's a marketing tool, so you might grab people's attention and then they might come to your gallery. So Dominique Levy wasn't convinced about that online viewing room in Art Basel. She said that most of the art pieces that were sold was because the outreach was done before. So it was not just because it's online, uh, you might see it. And Eva Pressenhuber that I interviewed last week, she, she just confirmed that. She said that she also created her online viewing room during this time of COVID-19. She said because she had to and asked well how many artworks have you sold and she said none like zero she said for instance there was a this is an artist sue williams that she's showing and she said there are not 50 collectors collecting this particular artist there are a few and then most of the times it's just you call up these collectors that you know and you say hey 
I have some artworks you might like. So that's how it works. But then on the other hand, I spoke with Christie's as well. And they told me that private sales uh, business that they have, they offer this online as well. And that one of the sellers of the piece when he offered his painting by Picasso, he wanted that Christie's puts it online. So he didn't just trust Christie's, you might find a, a, a buyer like that, please put it online as well. How do you think that the virtual art market will sort of advance to help that experience? I was thinking about how could you kind of copy that feeling of being in a space, maybe with virtual or augmented reality, having goggles on and you're immersed and there is also digital art and and, and things like that other than that I, I find it hard to there are a few things that i see that make sense online um for instance i saw that there's a lot of cooperation now happening as well uh, for instance the mega gallery david swerner that is offering his uh, website presence for smaller galleries because he has such an influence so you say hey you for the smaller galleries that are anyway struggling uh, we want to offer you our platform. So I think the virtual aspect might be more to collaborate, to give a first impression. Um, then also Instagram, um, the auctioneer Simon de Puri told me he thinks it's the future of the art market and that uh, it's great to discover new talent. I mean, like yourself. It gives emerging artists that don't necessarily have a gallery uh, representation the chance to grow their own audiences. So I think for that it's great, but I cannot really think about a tool that would replace something like a gallery or an art fair. I really think it's not offline versus online, it's, it's both together nowadays. And in the future, I think. You have to be seen by the right people and also being acknowledged by the right people. I mean, I do with all these interviews that you mentioned that it did, most of them were seen by, okay, maybe a few people here in Switzerland in the art world. But then the Dominic Levi interview I did was seen by Jerry Saltz, that is a Pulitzer Prize winner art critic. And he tweeted it and suddenly it got quoted by all these newspapers. So I think it's the same for an artist on Instagram. Um, just because you're out there, it doesn't mean that you will... May, somehow you also have to be seen by someone that has that power and influence to then support you by either you find a collector that is known or has a name that would start collecting you or, or a museum or something like that happens. Just being out online doesn't really make it, but, but the possibility is there. But then you hear of artists like cause you just make it somehow. But I think it's, it's on one side, you do all your work as much as you can and you put it out there. And then you also need a piece of luck that somehow comes together. You won't be discovered by not doing anything. You have to do your part, but it's also no guarantee. Even Prezer Huber said, you, you're looking at putting 10 years, 20 years into your career as an artist, as an art dealer, before you even really start to, to see any results. Galleries traditionally were here to see an artist, believe in that artist and nurture that and, and invest in that artist and go through good and bad times. And then at the end, yeah, they might become successful. I mean, nowadays it also changes a bit with, with big dealers uh, that just take artists on when they're already successful. So they were nurtured by smaller galleries before. So yeah, online, it's probably the same thing. You also have to work yourself these all these years, these 10 years until you're successful. And that the, on the other hand, it can just happen from one day to the other. But usually when you see people, oh, they made it from one day to the other, you don't see all the years that were before. Same for me somehow. I mean, now I'm, I'm 33 and I'm interviewing all these people. And, and sometimes I get younger journalists that ask me, oh, how do you do it? And, and oh, it's so great. But then I think back and I think my first TV experience was at the age of 15. Then I worked in youth television while I was 16, 17, 18 on, in my spare time. So that was all pre-work. Not that I did it with a goal. I just did it because I liked it, but it was all pre-work that led me to that. It just, it didn't just happen from one to do the other. You, you, are you, do you edit your own videos? You do your own, you film yourself. I do, I do. So, I mean, I don't film myself when I'm in the picture. Uh, for instance, Eva Preston, but then I had my, my own cameraman. But I do uh, usually 95% of my pieces are all edited by myself after. So I do, I, I actually love 
editing. For me, that's the creative part. It's being a bit of my own artist because then I overlay and I storytelling wise, I like to assemble it and, and, and cut. It's super fun. So as a reporter, you don't usually get to give your opinion. Who's going to be the future of the virtual art market? Or oh, who wow. Who should you be paying attention to? Hmm, difficult to say. I, I think like many of these art players that now became sort of a bit ahead with digitalization, it kind of happened because of the pandemic as well. So they had to react immediately. So I don't really know who is really leading what I've seen is that a few auction houses, like Sotheby's or Christie's, they have shifted things online and done a few things. I think Sotheby's has a gallery network where they offer also, as like David Turner, they offer the space for, for young, for galleries to offer their pieces through their platform. So things like that. I think House and Worth also did a lot, has a lot of online stuff going on with videos even offering documentaries on artists that you can watch online then i love to read artsy and artnet but that's more because i like to get the news from there not because i'm using there but they would sell art as well or or hold auctions i think there are many but i don't think that there's someone who is leading or mind-boggling if you know about something let me know no, I, I think it will be interesting. Somebody will invent something that is mind boggling. Yeah, if it's something that it's not just looking on a single screen all the time, I feel like often for me, the experience becomes somehow the same. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I feel like the experience is still the, the nicest when you actually go to a space, to a gallery, to a fair where you have all these people. And it's also, I think I like also enjoying it sometimes in solitude, but also the interplay of having people, meeting these characters and at the end. Yeah, that's yeah. what makes it exciting. The first artist that I interviewed, I had discovered her on Instagram and I was following her on Instagram. And I was in a gallery one day and looked over and there was this piece that I recognized from Instagram and it yeah the emotion of seeing it in person <laughs> that's great that's great yeah but that's exactly what I mean with it can work as a marketing tool it's like when you watch movies and you I remember when I went to New York the first time I was 13 but I already knew the city basically from all the movies I watched I've seen and then when I went there with my mom we're like this feels so fam- I'm here for the first time but this feels so familiar oh because you know it from so Probably that's what online and virtual and, and might help to just uh, also make it more accessible to people that maybe would not engage with art because they might not walk into a gallery, but now they might see it on Instagram. So it, it definitely has its good sides, its advantages. It, make, it makes art more uh, democratic, uh, opens it to a wider audience, less elitist. Well, um so stay tuned for the mind-boggling inventions that the, the virtual art market will bring us. Uh, are you able to say who your next interview is? Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, I interviewed Eva Pressenhuber, and it's not out yet, so that will be out soon. And then I also tried to get Ivan Wirth of House and Wirth again. Oh, yeah. Uh, he doesn't really like to give interviews, so I'm still waiting. I don't know if it's going to happen or not. Um, yeah, that's what I have in the pipeline. Well, I um, definitely will subscribe. No, I am subscribed. I definitely am subscribed to your channel, and I hope everybody else does too. And, and uh, I will subscribe to yours. <laughs> oh, yes. Thank you, because you're on it now. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, um, I'll, I'll sign up. It was, very, it was very nice to talk to you. Thank you so much. It was really nice talking to you too. <laughs> Thank you. I look forward to seeing more of your videos. Great. Yeah, same here. <laughs> Likewise. Hi guys, I hope you liked this video. Subscribe and like.